What's going on, everyone? Happy Wednesday. Welcome into the TDR Trade to Black podcast. I'm your host, Shad Dales. We have earnings coming out with Merrimed and CureLeaf. So we're going to update you guys as this podcast is going along based on their latest numbers as well. This is a State of the Union address, more or less, as we talk about cannabis and where it is right now. Yes, there's a lot of panic going on right now as these stocks continue to bleed out. But we want to look back at all the big announcements that were made in this industry over the last six months. As we all know, news is coming. So basically, we want to settle down the panic, look at like some of the biggest announcements that have happened over the past six months, and more importantly, why these are going to be monumental, because we all know, as I said, news is coming. It's just a matter of when. So let's jump into today's podcast. Welcome in TDR co-host Anthony Varel. Good to see you. And uh, yeah, another challenging day to say the least, as we keep saying, uh, especially last oh. week and the chart man was on. Hey. Uh, we need news. And that's, so you know, we just got news. Carolee already came out, but we'll right. run through those numbers in a couple minutes here. All right. That's Captain Obvious that we definitely need news. But like I said, we want to like just basically go through a lot of the big announcements that were made over the past six months to see basically where we are today and what we can anticipate, you know, moving forward, heading into March and into April. Uh, let's welcome also in TDR co-host Guap. Good to see you. Happy Wednesday. And uh, good to see you as well. Greetings, my fellow Earthlings. Happy to be here and get into it. Um, got a lot of news to go through and a lot of catalysts. So let's let's jump into it. Um, whenever you want to talk about Kira Leaf's top line numbers, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, you're sporting one of the greatest hats, too. That is sharp, brother. Very Thank sharp. You. Yes, Very Hartford sharp. Whalers, uh, part of my greatest sports logos collection. I love the negative space H for Hartford. I like the uh, white blazer and the blue shirt, too. You look like you're like Sonny Crockett, Miami this Vice, is, uh, showing my age. Ready to move to suit. I'm, I'm embodying for the State of the Union uh, the junior senator from North Carolina. Sear there Sucker. we go. All right, let's welcome in everybody. Welcome into the TDR Trade of Black podcast as we jump into the segment one, which is Into the Wire. Uh, you just said it, Anthony, that uh, Cureleaf just announced their latest yep. earnings. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but what are you seeing so right now? So fourth quarter, fourth quarter 2023 revenue, $345 million, representing an increase of 4% quarter over quarter. Okay. Fourth quarter adjusted EBITDA of $83 million, representing 24% of revenue, 490 BIPs improvement year over year on EBITDA. Full year 2023 cash flow from operations, 91 million. Hmm. So on first glance, 4% growth low. seems on par with every other big MSO yeah. thus far. Yeah, gross, gross profit for the fourth quarter was 156 million, 45%. Hmm. Um, the cash at the end of quarter, 91.8 million. So, I mean, that's a little bit light, um, but... I mean, I'm interested to see this earnings call. I'm interested to see what Boris has to say. And I mean, the revenue for the year was 1.35 billion. So from a top line perspective, they're leading the industry with the largest footprint plus the international business yeah. um, that Curaleaf currently has. Remember the days companies like this were doing two, 300 million annually. And we thought about that day yeah. of reaching a billion. We got to keep things into perspective. I know the waiting game is the hardest part. And I know the longer you wait, we get a little antsy. Uh, I think that is the yeah. case with the space right now. Important to share that tomorrow, CEO of Cureleaf, Matt Darren, is coming on. First time to the podcast we've had Boris Jordan on before, but we really want to get a chance to speak to Matt. Uh, I actually was with him back in December when they listed in the TSX. Great guy. Um, but yeah, he's been an integral part for that company. But uh, some decent numbers, but on par, I think, with the 4% growth like some of the other companies also important to share uh, outside of Matt Darren, uh, we've got quite the lineup coming up over the next two weeks. So we've got uh, Matt on tomorrow. Then we'll have on a week from today, David Gobert, CEO of Air Wellness. A week from tomorrow, David Hart, CEO of The Cannabis. A week from Friday, our good friends over at Terrison and CEO Ziad Ganam. And then uh, two weeks from yesterday, which is March the 19th, we will have a live stream special on a Tuesday. Why? Because a lot of people on here follow the high tide story, including you, Guap, as we bring Raj Grover back to the podcast. So some big, big podcast interviews coming up with the best and biggest thought leaders in the space. Uh, so that'll be interesting. I know, Guap, that you follow high tide closely. Yeah, I'm excited for that one. That's going to be the day after their conference call. So 
hope to uh, ask some some tough questions, um, but also just you know let everyone understand what the the story is there because it's a, they're they're using a different playbook. Yeah, one other important person to bring up: John Levine, CEO of Merrymed. Uh, we've had him on quite a bit. We're just scheduling him for early next week. That'll probably be a pre-record, but we'll have that posted yeah. at some point next week. They are announcing their earnings, uh, I think, as we're doing this live as well. So if there's some numbers that that's you guys why are I keep, seeing. That's yeah. why you see me keep looking at the to the left. I'm not ignoring you guys. I'm looking, refreshing <laughs> to, see right. if, uh, to see if Merrimed's going to pop. Yeah. Um, sorry, Mitch, that I kind of jumped to the uh, third uh, headline uh, on uh, Into the Wire. But let's uh, jump into headline number one. Mm -hmm. And rumors, rumors, and roar, more rumors. Uh, I don't want to start having doubts about the industry and rescheduling. I still think everything is headed in the right direction. But it is worth noting that last month, we had green market reporter John Schroyer on, who shared with us that rescheduling announcement is everybody's favorite word on here was imminent. Fast forward five weeks later, and now Schroyer is sharing that rescheduling is not going to happen this month. But in all honesty, I think we knew that. Um, yeah. Still thinking in what we're hearing that it is April or May. No one knows, but I keep hearing that over and over and over. But Guap, what was your reaction when you saw this tweet from John Schroyer? Yeah, I mean, initial reaction, I think, is probably natural. Is, is just a little disappointed, right? A little let down. When you, whenever you turn imminently into uh, April, um, it's, it's natural to be disappointed. Uh, but when you actually have time to process the information, take a breath, you're, we're once again getting some confirmation. And a New York Times reporter uh, reported the same thing as Schroyer, by the way, that they're talking to people in D.C. <clears throat> Maybe it's the same person. We don't know. Um, yeah. And they're both or, you know, they're they're getting uh, certainty from this person. Look, it's not happening uh march but it's happening in april um yep. net net you know the market likes certainty people like certainty i know the price action says uh the sky's falling but uh you know things will get really interesting when this announcement hits if it hits in april yeah well um more more thoughts on it i mean i think it's it's understandable for people to get very frustrated um whenever someone puts out a prediction based on a source that they got from DC, it's easy to dismiss the source and the mess kill the messenger. Um, yeah. We want people and journalists like Schroyer and and people from the Times to share this information with us. Um, so you know, it, it, I think this is probably like I tweeted earlier. You know, a result of uh, <clears throat> sharing information uh, from a like woefully uh inefficient government process right yeah i hear you um, anyone who's tried to predict optimistically what politicians are gonna do has been wrong um so we just have to to sit and sit tight and uh wait for april yeah happy um, burns writes i think having doubts is healthy shad we've been head faked for years can still be optimistic about it but no need to be blind fair enough and i completely agree with your yeah. sentiment um we've been down this road a million times uh, we've never, ever actually seen, though, an HHS recommendation to the DEA that rescheduling take place. The more that we can get agencies involved and less politicians, uh, I think that's just a positive sign. And that's why there's been so much positive uh, interest uh, in this industry over the past six months. But again, it's just the waiting game. And I know you love this topic more than anyone, Anthony. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, let me just preface this. Like, I like John. I, I respect John. I respect Debra. I like the green market report. Yeah. What John said yesterday, I don't really think needed to be said. We didn't right. need to hear that it's not definitively coming in March, that it might be April. If anything, that's just going to cause more negative sentiment. Yeah. We'd be better off just sitting there thinking, all right, it's coming. But to hear that it's not coming, that just gives more uncertainty. That's causing people to sell. That's causing people not to wait. Like it's just a net negative. There was no positive that came out of that. Do we have Zero. that tweet up? Uh, can you bring that tweet up, Mitch, if you have it? Yeah, there it is right there. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. I appreciate ears to the ground. I appreciate him acting as a source of information for the industry. But there is nothing from that tweet that is a net positive. If anything, it was a net negative. A hundred percent. Yeah. So, I mean, 
it, 65,000 views though. Yeah, I mean it's great, but I mean he's not monetizing his ex. He's not monetizing his ex. His ex profile off of that. There was the, the, there was nothing to gain from it. I mean it's great insight. We're gonna go another month without getting a without getting a headline, and it's a sea of red today. Um, so we know March is pretty much going to be a dead month, as we've seen with the earnings prints last week. This sector does not trade on fundamentals. This head this sector right now trades on headlines and hype. And there will probably be no headline coming in the month of March. Yeah, I hear you there. Well, it's not holding back. Henry Lopez just bought the dip. Good for you, Henry. If that's what you feel confident with. And buying dips are buying dips are great. I mean, you DCA into positions. If that's the kind of investor you are and that's how you want to manage your money, it's fantastic. But I mean, that being said, don't forget that these stocks are well a hundred percent off of most of the lows from before the HHS announcement. So I mean, if we're gonna get another four weeks of nothing, like they can drift lower yeah. um, to, to much lower levels. I'm yeah. not saying they're going to, and I sure as hell don't want them to, but the reality of it is, I mean, you could be looking at stocks that just sit there and dwindle um, because we now know definitively that probably nothing's coming this month. Got to love our good friend, Christopher Braddy, hoping for a ske uh, scheduling announcement today. I think he's uh, commenting on that in every single live stream. He I'm has said you. that every day. I, 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 I commend, I, I commend the optimism. Hey, I wish I was as bright eyed. I wish I was as bright eyed, bushy tailed as he is. <laughs> well, keep at it, Christopher, because one day you're going to be right. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. Jose writes, did you guys talk about Tilray hitting the all time low again? I think it's the bottom. I did not see what their price is doing, but uh, regardless, I don't think there's, you know, Tilray's by itself right now. There's a lot of stocks that are bleeding right now. This is the TDR Trade of Black podcast. I'm your host, Shad Dales. Thanks for checking in. We're with Anthony Burrell and Guap as we're talking about the state of the union with the cannabis industry. As well, we always talk about crypto. 48 hours ago, we talked about Bitcoin perhaps hitting all-time highs. And here we are 48 hours later, Anthony, and it hit an all-time high yesterday. And momentum, it just continues to grow. In poetic fashion, Bitcoin hit the all-time high on Sam Bankman-Fried's birthday <laughs> of all days. So, Sam, I hope you're enjoying your time in prison. It's uh, <laughs> probably not too comfortable in there. Um, if he could have kept the Ponzi going for just a little bit longer, he probably wouldn't have been in that predicament. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's great. Bitcoin's cranking. Ethereum's cranking. I mean, here's the silver lining. If you want to go on a sector being legitimized with a major ETF and how capital inflows to that ETF are going to that. affect the underlying assets, just look at what the Bitcoin ETFs did to Bitcoin. Not going to say that this is going to happen, but the writing's kind of on the wall. If we get Schedule 3, institutional capital starts to come in, MSOS starts to see massive capital inflows. I'd be willing to bet the underlyings are going to start to have charts that look like Bitcoin yeah. um, from the inception of the ETFs when the gloves are off and the capital can actually come in. Um, it might be a while until that happens, but the good thing for us is, is we're not waiting on approvals. Thanks to Dan and the guys at Advisor Shares and people who want to say whatever you want to say about the ETF, the pipe's already built. Yeah, It's there it, it, It's there to have inflows and, and allocate capital across the underlyings and if and when that day happens that we get federal reform and we get some sort of headline, it's it's going to be off to the races. Yep, that's for sure. When we look at Bitcoin as a whole, like yesterday, we had an interesting conversation with uh, Morgan Creek Digital CEO, uh, Mark Yusko, who shared that right now, the baby boomer generation currently holds around $30 trillion in fungible assets. However, with these spot ETFs, it's now attracting the boomer generation. And if we look, you know, about potentially an influx of capital, uh, allocated towards Bitcoin, there were some staggering numbers that he shared with us. And, uh, you know, do you want to maybe bring up some of those numbers and stats that he was uh, speaking with us, uh, Anthony? Yeah. So, I mean, with a, with a 30, with a 30 trillion asset, through a $30 trillion asset pool, if 1% is allocated to that, I yeah. mean, you're looking at a, if 1% of that is allocated to Bitcoin, which right now people are allocating money to Bitcoin without actually allocating money to Bitcoin. Their financial advisors at Fidelity, their financial advisors at BlackRock. Well, Vanguard, no, because they they didn't allow the ETFs um, within their ecosystem. But asset managers and asset allocators are just automatically allocating a portion of whatever your, whatever money that it is going into your retirement account into these ETFs on a monthly basis. If and when that wealth is transferred yes. and it's actually unleashed, I mean, 1% might be 
a small number compared to what's actually going to be allocated towards that asset class, especially if you want to look at Bitcoin as a hedge against inflation or digital gold, um, which I think in the, the the modern portfolio is about a 3% allocation to assets like gold. So 3% gets allocated. You're looking at about a trillion dollars. That's a lot of money. Um, that could be, Yeah, it is. A lot of money. Now you can understand why people are so optimistic and the upside to uh, where Bitcoin is headed. Um, all right, gents, that concludes Into the Wire, um, outlining the biggest headlines in cannabis in crypto. And like we said off the top, as we segue into segment two, we want to make this more of a conversational part, but it's like the state of the union with regards to the cannabis space. I want to look back at some of the recent announcements that were made within this industry over the past six months. And we'll begin, obviously, with the big one, which was back on August 29th, when the HHS recommended to the DEA that cannabis should be rescheduled to a, a Schedule Three controlled substance. Uh, when we look back at that announcement, Guap, I'll start with you. But yes, we're in these trying times right now. We're frustrated. We're looking at everything kind of bleeding out right now. But if we look back at that particular moment, you heard that announcement. Like, how would you feel? Let's like remind ourselves, like, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, what that moment was for the interest uh, for investors uh, jumping back into this uh, industry. Yeah, for me, that's where I start my chart. It's what brought me back to Twitter into being sort of hyper diligent about following the space again. It really reignited everything uh, for me and for a lot of folks. So um, it was big because it was a bit unexpected. If you think back, it was October 22, I believe, that um, Biden tweeted he was initiating the process. I might be wrong on that date. Um, but Secretary Becerra had given himself to the end of the year 23 to uh, make a recommendation and came in well ahead of schedule on like a random Tuesday, August yeah. 29th. So um, obviously the volume was massive in MSOS. Uh, everyone started following the space. Mainstream media got a hold of it. I mean, it really lit a powder keg of attention there. Um, so that's where I start the chart. Yeah, no kidding. And really, I think it brought a lot of investors back into this space, don't you? You know, that's Captain Hobbyist again, I'll say, Anthony, but, you know. Brought enthusiasm. It definitely brought enthusiasm and it legitimized it. I mean, the HHS recommendation legitimized cannabis. I yes. mean, when we saw that unredacted HHS report, which I know we'll get into downstream, but when that thing was sent over to the DEA, everyone was put on notice that cannabis is being looked at legitimately. Yeah, by the federal agencies. That was the biggest inflection point that we're probably going to see outside of the actual announcement of these of rescheduling. Yeah. And then stocks ripped for what, three weeks? Was it three weeks? About three weeks there? and then round tripped it right back to where they were. Yeah. Well, we fast forward four weeks later, it goes into our next announcement. We were actually at the Benzenga conference in Chicago. All three of us were. And we got the news that Safer Banking passed the Senate committee producing more momentum where uh, I think, Anthony, when we were there, it was positive vibes in comparison yeah. to what the conference was uh, last year in April. Uh, it was like a complete 180, but a lot of momentum was building and a lot of positive sentiment was growing when we were at that conference pertaining to that announcement. Yeah, I mean, it was great. It was a feeling of jubilance. Um, it was definitely an awesome feeling like, oh, safe might actually happen. That being said, I know I've saw it on the timeline today. There's a lot of people that are saying that safe is starting to rear its head again. Schumer mentioned it twice today. I'm not going to talk about safe outside of this segment unless something actually gets taken to a floor vote. Um, Chuck's just dangling the bill. He's like we've said, he's got the sponsors. Don's legitimized that he's got the sponsors. Um, safe is is cool. It's a good talking point, but you can't base any of your investment thesis or any of your enthusiasm towards the cannabis industry based on the safe banking app from what we have seen thus far. Like I yeah. said, we celebrated the 10 year anniversary of it being introduced um, this year. I mean, yeah. that's, that's pretty much all you need to know. Well, I think one thing that I'm learning more than anything over the last couple of months is just the dialogue that uh, Don Murphy has been, you know, talking to us, having these conversations. Uh, if there's any person that I rely on as far as credibility, as we've said before, he has no vested interest. You know, he has not invested in this space. He's going based off the, you know, the credentials and the contacts that he has in Washington. His latest tweet last week was saying that we should have safe at some point in July. And yeah. I asked the question two weeks ago, 
do you still feel very confident that rescheduling and safe happens before the election? And his flat out answer was one word. And that was yes. And we haven't heard him say that before, you know, like any boss. And I believe, and I believe him. I, yeah. I, I, I believe Don on that. I believe Don at face value with what he says, yeah. but am I going to base any of my forward and am I going to base any of my go forward investment decisions around the safe banking act or put on a, put on a list that I think a catalyst, a major catalyst this year is going to be safe banking and deploy capital around that. Absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, thanks for everybody for checking in. Actually, just looking at the numbers right now, this is actually our biggest live stream uh, to date, you know, here this afternoon. So if you're new to the program, make sure to click on that like button, smash it, leave comments below. We want to build this community and make this go viral. YouTube loves those algorithms. So liking and providing comments below, feel free to like, put out any comment we'll address it here on the podcast here today but uh again we appreciate and as usual we have our daily newsletter here at tdr called the baked in newsletter mitch if you can add that link into the comment section or log on to the dalesreport.com we provide equity research reports of the top 69 cannabis companies in the industry so if you want full equity research reports that you have access to that normally the banks do we're giving back to you the everyday investors so make sure to subscribe to our baked in newsletter uh, back to our announcements over the past six months, like all good things come to an end. And I don't want to say we're at an end, but shortly after that announcement, chaos ensued, obviously, in Washington when uh, Matt Gates, uh, Congressman Matt Gates, had then Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy removed. And essentially, it ended a lot of momentum. I don't want to say specifically for safe, but there was bigger fish to fry and topics to basically cover off and concerns. But that was chaos, if I remember correctly. Was that two weeks before we actually had? Uh, uh, Speaker of the House again. It was just, it was mass chaos, like I said, two weeks and, you know, killed a lot of momentum that uh, SAFE was uh, building, Guap. Yeah, I mean, it. I, I don't want to comment on on all that uh, process in the, in Congress, but yeah, I mean, suddenly the House was not a functioning branch of government. You know, it's like legislative. No, Matt, Gates, legis Matt Gates took it over himself. Yeah, we thought legislative uh, was our least efficient branch of government. I mean, when it really shuts down it, and they don't have a speaker, it, it, uh, yeah, safe's not passing that week. Yeah. yeah. August, or excuse me, October 26th, we then had the David Boyce lawsuit. And for everybody following this space, they don't really uh, need to be reminded of what this was all about. For those that don't, this is where a coalition of cannabis operators formed a lawsuit against the U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland, which really generated a lot of attention pertaining to this. But again, I think in a lot of ways, it was a step in the right direction for the cannabis industry based off this lawsuit and some of the uh, concerns that they had. Right, Anthony? Yeah, it's great. I mean, the boys lawsuit, again, like I've said, all three branches of government are in talks for cannabis reform with the judicial, legislative and executive and the boys lawsuit, while I do support it. I support the people behind it. Emily Paxia, Jason Wild, um, several of the other um, prominent figures in the space. I mean, it's got to get pretty much all the way up to the Supreme Court in order for it to, to make a difference. That being said, it's in the process of getting there. Um, I hope it does get there. Um, and it's definitely another meaningful step and a meaningful like cog in the wheel of notable ca notable reform that's going on in the cannabis space yeah that's for sure rainy uk writes not knowing the u.s government timetable so what would you say are the april quote potential dates to mark on the calendar would be no right. one knows if anyone tells you around 420 they're full of shit because we have yeah. no idea yeah nobody knows any dates you'll never hear me put a date out of my mouth as far as any of these timelines or whatever goes. Like I said, I'm sticking to my guns. I said early Q2, late Q1. That's still intact. Yes. If it passes, I was wrong. This but, guy's got one of the greatest names. Skip Swellman. Love the name. I have nothing yeah. to argue with Anthony about. Not, He's on point today. Thank you, gentlemen. What were you going to say? Yeah, we will not be, I won't be giving, we won't be giving out dates on the show anytime soon. As far as, uh, as far as the, uh, speculation around schedule three i mean i know it's been state of the union it's been 420 there was a couple of other dates they're great in they're great conjecture and great in conversation but not today 
Yeah. William, Jonathan, we are waiting for you guys to talk about cure leaf. We did top line it a bit we off did. the top. If you were late. So after this podcast is done, we did touch on that, but a quick reminder, if you were late running into the podcast, CEO of cure leaf, Matt Darren will be coming on for a special live stream tomorrow, beginning at four o'clock. We'll dive deep into those numbers, but right now from what we're reading, it seems to be on par with the other MSOs where we saw 4% growth. But a big number, what was it, 1.35 billion for 1.35 billion. So yeah, Cureleaf again leads the industry in top line revenue. And I mean, from what I can see, the numbers are pretty good. I'm gonna dive into these deeper after so we can get a real talk out of Matt uh tomorrow. And then I look forward to listening to Boris after the on the conference call after yeah. we jump off this. Okay. Uh next big announcement, and this is probably the biggest one outside of the HHS recommendations, was the unredacted HHH HHS drop, which really opened up a lot of eyes as to how long people have been misled, Guap, about cannabis for quite some time. When you read this, what do you think kind of impact this had, not only for the cannabis landscape, but uh a lot of people from Washington once they uh actually this went you know, viral and was public information. Yeah. The leak on August 29th, uh, where it said, you know, it recommended to be schedule three was our understanding. Yeah. It wasn't really confirmed until we saw the unredacted document. So there was still some uncertainty floating out there. Um, and this cleared that up rather quickly. I would say the 20 August 29th leak, was like in, in stock shooting up as a cannabis investor. That was my most exciting uh, day. That's what got me to tune it back in, in recent history. Um, but this unredacted drop of the actual information yeah. is my favorite moment in like, I don't know, cannabis history. I know. Like it, it, it was massive because it was the government essentially admitting that the war on drugs was a waste of taxpayer resources. Yeah, you know that it's safer than alcohol, that it's medicine, um, and that it was definitely at least Schedule Three, right? It uh, left the door open for perhaps uh, an, a real argument for descheduling at some point, eventually, right? No yeah. dates, but for me, this was a a massive moment for a lot of people. This was uh, vindication. It was confirmation of of stuff we already knew. Uh, it it you know, 250 pages uh, still gets me really excited to talk yeah. about. Anthony, listen, you follow this space for a long, long time. You both have. If we look back at, you know, one, two, three years down the road from now and look back at this announcement when this information went public, do you think we look back at this and say this was a massive turning point for the industry? Yeah, there's, as far as I'm concerned, there are two points in history that are huge and the, the, the two biggest inflection points. Yep. For this industry, the HHS recommendation. Yep. When Constellation invested in Canopy, those were the two. Those are the, the those are two of the data points that we'll go back and see. And those were when the industry was legitimized. Yes. Constellation enterprise level enterprise level business putting five billion dollars into Canopy growth. Say what you want about Canopy growth. Say they burned all the money. Whatever. That was. That, that put everybody on notice. The second ding, one, ding, yes. ding, ding, yeah. right? The HHS recommendation. And then when we actually get something implemented, yeah. Um, with, with whether it be schedule three, safe banking, I would say might be just as monumental as one of those if it's implemented. But I think it would be schedule three would be the three. And then that's that's pretty much the Mount Rushmore of data points as to when this sector really took off. So um, you back in August, when the HHS made the recommendation to the DEA, you know, rescheduling will be as big as the Constellation announcement back in 2018 of $5 billion. But you think the recommendation is close to being on that par of like, as far as significance for this industry? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was it was cannabis was legitimized. I mean, granted, the unredacted, the unredacted I win email um, from uh, from Shane Pennington and the on drugs guys was pretty big. I mean, they said the quiet park out loud. They compared cannabis to alcohol in terms of just the general danger to society. They admitted medical benefits to cannabis. Yes. Like they finally said the they finally said the quiet part out loud. Um yes, the the HHS recommendation and canopy growth getting the five bill. Um 
I would say are, are, are neck and neck. And those are two of the biggest headlines that we've seen in the cannabis industry to date. Yeah. Wolfie. Yeah. Wolfie. Cannabis. Ha ha ha. Good to see you, my friend. I haven't seen you comment on our podcast, but uh, Mr. Spout of four is on. Good to see you. Anyway, were you going to say guap? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, cannabis has been federally illegal since 1937. So the government releasing research report like that is is absolutely massive we're not yeah. going to see the yeah. impact of it for a little while here but um yeah big. yeah i mean i really hope that that report doesn't go to waste or that yeah. recommendation was made in vain great um, comment from constructive economics absolutely spot on five billion in hhs recommendation was consequential without that five billion in cgc which is canopy i don't think we'll be here today no so, way said it once and i'll say it many times i don't think we're sitting here without canopy growth yep at all. yep at all people want to talk about the canadian industry if the canadian industry did not get the amount of of institutional capital and interest that it got when it did granted there was a shitload of value destruction that money doesn't come into the us we don't see cannabis really take mainstream i mean if it's thanking Justin Trudeau for one thing, it's 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 legalizing cannabis. It's about the only thing, um, buddy, at, at the country level, <laughs> and that is about the only thing. Uh, we look at the next announcement as we uh, segue along here, and as I said, that um, unredacted. I think that was January fifteenth. Yes, just looking at the dates here. Then attorney Adrian Sneed put out on LinkedIn January thirty first. Has that been already six weeks? That said, Probably. imminent news, we will get news at some point later this week. Then he kind of backfired on him, saying that he was going to come in and edit the actual post, that he was gone for 10 minutes. And by the time he came back to his desktop computer, everything went viral. And now it's just, we're just speculating. Now we're at this point now where everything that was put into fruition back in the fall, it's just pure weight C mode as to where we are today. And it's pure speculation right now. Yeah, I mean that 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 LinkedIn post looking back at it was just irresponsible. Yeah. Um, I do think that he might have had good information as I mean, I looked into him, I looked through his resume, I looked through his LinkedIn, I looked at his professional experience before I tweeted anything about it because I thought it was just fraudulent at first. Um, I mean, he seemed like he was a pretty serious dude. I mean, I emailed him, invited him on the show, he accepted it, and then after the post went viral, he randomly had a family birthday come up. Um, and had to cancel on us. So yeah, goes to go, 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 goes to show you what happened. Um, that was an interesting part, but I mean, it just goes to be the speculation. I think he exacerbated the move up from the week before. Yeah. Um, if that doesn't come out, we probably would have seen a, some consolidation or correction and the drop down wouldn't have been as, as aggressive as what we saw. Yeah. Guap, I see a smile on your face. It was a wild time. We got imminent from Schroyer. Um, Sneed put out a post uh, not too soon after that, um, continuing that rally, like like Anthony was saying. So, um, yeah, I mean, we in both cases absolutely destroyed the messenger. Um, yeah. If you look at the the blowback they were get, Sneed was getting on LinkedIn. Uh, the number of retweets, that's probably the most popular Schroyer tweet of all time. You know, it, I don't think they quite realized when they dropped that news out there, just how many of us there are watching every single word. Um, and so I think, you know, I kind of, I feel a little bit bad for Sneed to be perfectly honest, but maybe that's the, the empathetic, uh, guap shining through a little bit, but yeah, I, I think he put it out there. He, he uh, came back 30 minutes later and had just a LinkedIn blew up. Suddenly he's having probably a very uncomfortable conversation with, because uh, it was during trading hours, if I'm not mistaken, as oh, it well. Was, it was like, it was a one in the afternoon. Yeah. The market, so moved, like, the market moved. The market yeah, moved on that. Right. When, that. when Sneed moved markets will be a, always a very interesting uh, uh, point in time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the window cleaner speaks on behalf of 99% of cannabis investors. If you don't have credible info, shut the up. Right? Yeah. That is that is a very true statement, and that holds true for cannabis. We're going to miss these Wild West days years from now, writes Ross Stepp. I don't know if we'll miss those. I, I do want to meet the sources at one point. I want to meet them. Yeah. 
I like what uh, somebody wrote here, Lance uh, Finlinson. We sneed some good news. Yes, yeah. yes, we do. Um, well, <laughs> and then that segues basically where we uh, mentioned off the top. Uh, John Schroyer, as of today, with the latest intel of DC and cannabis rescheduling not going to happen this month, but maybe in April, or it is DEA simply being cautious, moving slowly. Um, but this is not coming before April. So all in all, as we've said all along, no one knows, but some of the powers to be within the industry, even going back to last fall, if they had to predict, they said end of Q1, early Q2. We're not there yet, but you know we will see come next month if we do have an announcement. Um, but no one knows, as I said before, we continue to wait. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's uh, it's an industry that is polarizing. People begin to remain interested, as we've said in the last few podcasts. When you look at some of these catalyst moments outside of Washington, Anthony, you've talked about the ballot. No news is good news. Uh, if we get oh. adult use on the ballot in Florida, Ohio, yeah. Pennsylvania, Virginia. I've got a lot of people, I've got a lot of people telling me they're going to let the timer run out. They're not, you're oh. not going to hear anything. You're not going to hear anything from the Florida Supreme court. Interesting. It's they're going to let it, they're going to let April 1st come and it's going to elapse and then it's going to get on the ballot. So what these politicians I think are just going to handle, they're not going to put their name, stamp it and get in front of this. It's just like, they're going to turn yeah. a blind eye. And if they turn a blind eye, then people get what they want. They're not attached to it whatsoever, but more yeah. importantly, you know, the residents, the Floridians, and more importantly, people within this industry that follow closely from an investment standpoint, get what they want, right? Yeah. And I mean, if anything, if anyone follows Canosaurus on Twitter, the data that he's putting out right now in regards to the Florida market is fantastic. I mean, yeah. ahead of adult use, you should be going through that data and looking at the companies that are increasing sales in the state of Florida and the companies that are decreasing sales in the state yeah. of Florida, because there's some trends you can identify and the data that he's getting out of the OMMU numbers is fantastic. I read every single thread that he posts on there and they've been spot on okay. um, in terms of the, uh, of the Florida operators. Lucifer, good to see you. I'm kind of getting that from my everything about, I'm kind of getting that from everything about now. What is the absolute last second for anything to happen? That's the day. Well, the absolute last second is November 4th or 5th, um, <laughs> whenever election day is this year which uh which will be interesting yeah what are you talking about joe biden's gonna light one up in the state of the union yeah before i let you guys go and feel feel free to leave a couple comments people out there but what do you think he'll do if that day comes rescheduling is announced what do you think he'll do guap uh, i think we're gonna go live um i've got a funny costume all planned out maybe a dance dance off um but then, you know, then reality will set in. We've got comment periods. We've got legal challenges. It, and then we we can't tell you exactly when it's going to be signed into law and 280E goes away. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we're definitely going to take the win. We're going to watch stocks rip and dance around a little bit for sure. Um, I mean, it, it's going to be a good day. Hmm. Um, I got some interesting information, too, um, just with regards to just how people are handling this you know, industry right now, but, um, yeah, I think a lot of right now are people buying on the dip. Um, it's a good question. Uh, some people have took profits uh, on the second weeks of February. Some of the credit investors I've been speaking with, but, uh, all in all, um, until news on rescheduling comes out, but even if they will rally and pull back, it'll schedule three implemented months afterwards. So I think once the announcement, as we all know, well, once the implementation of which Schedule 3 actually includes and all the itinerary that's included in it, you'll get the announcement, probably a pullback again, and then you've got all the itinerary basically to figure out, which will probably be over the next 6 to 12 months. But, you know, needless to say, uh, a lot of eyes following this industry as they continue to be. Uh, I hope that helps kind of explain the timeline, the State of the Union that we have indicated within this industry over the uh, past six months and uh, where we are today, and more importantly, continue to have these podcasts and what we want to do moving forward. But this is good, gents. appreciate all the feedback. Yeah, yeah it was sure. great. And then I know that we didn't get to go over it, but Elizabeth Warren came out again today saying reschedule or legalize and deschedule cannabis. Yeah. And Tim Scott was outed for voting against the Safe Banking Act. So don't forget that when, uh, when you go to hit the polls. Lance Finlinson writes, please don't dance, Guap. Um, why he not? Can't, he can't stop me. Happy Glass. It's I love the, the comments. Right. 
Keep them coming, Thank brother. You, Good to see you. Uh, oh, as this well, is you- true. Lucifer, you're right. That show Shogun is amazing. It's like Game of Thrones with samurais. Hmm. It's absolute. It's all subtitles, but it works really, really well. Huh. One of my favorite fictional books for sure. It's a it's a monster. Yeah, that was a really that's a really good show. That and Masters of the Air. What's the one great, I just watched on, uh, uh, with with uh, Sofia Vergara? That was a great one. Griselda. Whew. Wasn't great, yeah. but uh, I was found it interesting that Pablo Escobar said he's only scared of one person, and that was her. And I was like, yeah. She was intense, that's for sure. But uh, anyways, gents, uh, as a quick reminder, as usual, please like this video. I appreciate all the feedback, everyone, as we build this community. Always appreciate you logging on every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We're adding in a few more podcasts. Uh, we get any kind of announcements happen. We're going to do this a daily podcast because going to be so much to talk about as we want to take this mainstream. So like I said, smash that like button. Leave some comments below. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. And as usual, leave that link below, Mitch, if you can. Subscribe to our daily newsletter called The Baked In Newsletter, highlighting all the biggest headlines in cannabis, psychedelics, and crypto. As well, every Thursday, we drop another equity research report that's exclusive for Baked In Newsletter subscribers. So again, thanks. Uh, Mitch, thanks on the back end. Gentlemen, enjoy the rest of your day and look forward to seeing you back here in 24 hours with the CEO of Cureleaf, Matt Darren. Meantime, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Stay up. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. And if you want to learn more about the emerging industries that we cover. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. And if you want to learn more about the emerging industries that we cover, then leave a comment below and let us know who you want us to interview, the questions you want asked, and the information that you want to learn. We want to hear from you. As usual, click on that bell for all notifications to get the latest information. Share this video with your network and don't forget to subscribe to our channel because